Good morning, everyone. Oh my goodness, I cannot believe that the moment is finally here. We are launching the 2021 Rethinking Church Virtual Summit Ministry That Impacts. And we have an exciting three days in store for you guys. So whether you are watching live or if you're catching the replay, you do not want to miss a moment of this summit. So I don't want to prolong the time. This morning, we have our amazing... Welcome, ladies. Thank you for getting up early this morning to be a part of this conversation. Morning. Thank you so much for the invitation. Wonderful. So let's start with you, Portia. Could you um, introduce yourself and just tell our audience a little bit about your background? Okay. My name is Portia Jacobs, and I am a career educator in the public schools of North Carolina. Just finished my 24th year as a um an educator. I've been both a classroom teacher and a school counselor, dean of students, all those iterations. But on the church side, I am a director of Christian education for both my annual conference and my Episcopal district. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for being with us. Reverend Green, please introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. So I'm Reverend Renita Green. I am a uh, 20-year pastor of St. James, well, uh, in the AME Church. I've been at St. James AME Church in Cape Girardeau, Missouri for six years. Um, but when I end this annual conference, I'll be ending 20 years. And I'm starting a new career journey as the um, Associate Director of Religious Diversity and Ecumenical Ministry at the University of Dayton. Congratulations. That's a new promotion. It is. Started. I start Friday. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So let's jump right in. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation, it stemmed from a few years ago when Kanye West said slavery was a choice. And it really hit home to me that there are a lot of people who don't understand the history of racism in this country. And so as we start looking at solutions, my question is, can education be one of the tools to help combat racism? And we can start with you, Reverend Green. Yeah, so um, I would say emphatically, yes, that education can be a tool to combat racism. Um, unfortunately, in some of my adjunct work here in Southeast Missouri, um, you know, it's clear that some young people choose to not be educated and, right. and to see how they respond um, in the um, courses that they're required to take, um, the diversity classes that, they, that they, they're they supposed to take. Um, one student told me that um, we should make such a big deal about lynching because lynching happened everywhere. And it's not unique to the United States. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? wow. So, um, so, so the academy is a great place to be able to um, introduce new ideas, um, and with the students come out of their environments where they've been raised and whatever I ideology that they've been raised in. Um, here in Southeast Missouri, um, often when students come to the university here, it's the first time they've left their small towns mm -hmm. and. Cape Girardeau is a big town for them. Mm -hmm. It's the first time they've been around any non-white person. And it's the first time that they've had to take authority from uh, non-white people. And so often um, the black professors report how the students um, respond to them. And um, it, it just kind of, it, it's just very eye-opening how there are students who just feel like they don't have to take direction from non-white people or resent having to take direction from non-white people. So the the academy is this great place to say, hey, welcome to the world, that the world isn't white. And um, and we don't all have to operate in under your white lens. So um, so 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 that's a great place for a lot of reasons. It's not just for the 
um, academic information that the students will receive, but it's also the social engagement that the students encounter. Wow. Portia, what are your thoughts? Because you work with younger people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so how, what are their attitudes or what are your thoughts as far as like using education at that level to combat racism? Well, education, in my opinion, absolutely should be one of the main tools we use to combat racism. Um, it's always interesting to me to watch the kids, um, and I was, I'll say kids, students, all of that. Um, when they're on sports teams or they're in clubs, they are completely, you know, integrated and all that's cool. You're my, my teammate. We're good. But as soon as all that's over, they, you know, segregate back into their friend groups, their peer groups, their areas. Um, and my school is, is kind of unique, I think, in that our kids are very active and aware. We have a, a young Democrats club, a young um, Republicans club, um, an activism club. Uh, we have a significant uh, group of uh, refugees and evacuees from countries all over the world being in Durham with Duke University here, North Carolina Central, um, UNC Chapel Hill, all in the area. So we have a lot of students who are also the, I'm sorry, students who are the children of professors, doctors, all that. So we have a very, very, very diverse population at our school. But again, they, they mesh well when it comes to who I'm going to pass the ball to. Right. But when I'm getting ready to go eat in the cafeteria, you know, everybody is is in their their groups. And I think sometimes it's because we don't get past that, you know, where we are with them in that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't really get to know the real person. And that's why I'm saying education kind of opens our minds. Our Reverend Green is so right in that those kids go to school with those things that were taught to them at home firmly implanted in their minds and, and you can't convince them of anything. Mm -hmm. If we could just get them to open their minds and see other people as not a threat, as not something that is so different, you know, maybe we could get them to kind of open up their hearts as well, because that that's a lot of the problem. We see people and make a judgment about who they are just by what we see. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and students, students, children, young people are no different. Yeah. Wow. So Reverend Green, do you think like this education needs to happen like at the elementary level, like the level of exposure? Do you feel like it's almost too late once they get to college? Because um, as Portia was saying, like their minds are kind of made up. Do you feel like do you see any change that happens with them in the um, college experience? Well, first of all, I'll say that it's never too late. Okay. Um, I was raised very white. Um, in very racist home. And I do not remember anything being taught about the civil rights movement. I, I mean, I, like I was in my 20s before I really learned about anything that was happening just years before I was born. It wasn't talked about in my home. Um, it just wasn't there. So um, it's not too late to learn it. It's never too late to learn it. But yes, learning at an earlier age. And I would even push to say that the what's learned has to not begin with, with um, slavery. And that tends to be where teaching starts. And um, Black history does not start with slavery. And I would suggest that slavery is more about white history than it is about Black history. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that also needs to be taught. And also what needs to be taught is about the abolitionists and about people who really, uh, you know, help white people who helped um, push the Underground Railroad forward. When, when we are not taught that we were part of liberation, then we always see ourselves as in this place of opposition or powerless to make a difference in the movement for justice. And when we start learning that there are people who look like us who did not ascribe to the, the, the prevailing values, we, we can become more empowered to push the, um, to, to push the, the envelope, at, at, so to speak, when it comes to um, dealing with issues, um, particularly around systemic racism. And so um, I think that the earlier, and, and I also, 
you know, I, I understand Black History has a place and Black History Month and that's, you know, valuable, but it should not just be February. And now we have this big excitement and doors are decorated and there's a program and the church has a program and school has a program that is after school hours and the students may or may not come to it. Mm. Uh, white students may or may not come to it. So it becomes more of a celebration than an education, which is great, but also it's a great opportunity for education and white people do not require the students to attend these opportunities where they can learn about the geniusness of um, people of African descent and how America really was built and designed um, out, out of the minds and off of the backs of people who do not look like me. So um, I think the earlier um, young people learn this and, and that it's integrated into all the history um, that, you know, if we're, if we're studying you know, the Industrial Revolution that we don't leave out um, the the black people who were inventors and creators and designers and engineers um, and not just wait until February to teach that. And I love that you said that black history does not begin with slavery. And I really feel like that's a part of the education that we need to advocate for, because if people truly understood the history of the world and mm -hmm. not just American history um, that starts when you know we were colonized, but if we truly understood and went back and looked at the history of civilization, I do think that that would change the mindset of some people about who different cultures are. Mm -hmm. um, Portia, I want to ask you, you said that like your school system has like a lot of different ethnicities. Do uh, is there racism against some of their refugees or some of the other populations? Because a lot of times we only think about racism in terms of black people experiencing it. But what are some do you find like there's some issues that other um, ethnicities are dealing with as well? Yeah, okay, I want to talk about that, but can I go back to something? Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, <laughs> when she talked about not being taught, I'm from a small town that's about um, 25 miles from Wilmington, North Carolina. I just learned about the Wilmington race riots of 1898 in a major way, like, you know, as an adult. Right. And I was a history major at one of the major universities in North Carolina. Still didn't hear a whole lot about it. Wow. I learned more from the, the documentary Wilmington on Fire and how Wilmington was a very integrated city. There were black uh, shop owners and land owners, property owners who were literally killed or run out of town. And that the legal system was used to then, you know, pick up those mortgages or the magistrates were transferring property from those black property owners who were forced to flee to um, white property owners or desirers of their property who stayed in town. So you're right, Reverend Green, that there's so much that we don't teach even in our own areas about the history mm -hmm. of that area. I, I mean, I had no clue about everything that went into those race riots. So when I saw that documentary, too, and one thing that really connected with me, and I think this is why it's so important to understand the history. I thought about how um, communities of color are are maybe they're not attacked by white people in the same way. But, you know, we call it gentrification now. But, you know, whether it's the divestment of uh, public resources, and, you know, the allowing crime to grow, allowing plot properties to dilapidate and then going in, swooping in. Um, and, and I've even pastored in a community where the city set these um, codes that were so unreasonable mm -hmm. for people to meet in terms of their old houses and bringing them up to code. And they were just taking their houses. Absolutely. People are just taking their houses. The attack now is is economically and financially more than physically. Mm -hmm. um, here in Durham, I worship at St. Mark AME Zion Church that sits right next to the Durham Freeway. But when the Durham Freeway was put in in like the 50s and 60s, it was brought through the major black community, the Haytai community. That was a very lucrative area. You know, Durham had what they called a black Wall Street. North Carolina Mutual Insurance was like the big, the largest black insurance company. And they brought intentionally, I would have to think, the freeway 
right through the community, which number one, took your property from you, mm -hmm. but two, it also took your livelihood and your business and forced you to then patronize other businesses. Right. So, you know, you got a twofer when you, and that happened in so many cities that they, they brought these highways and these freeways yeah. and through ways and whatever other way they could come up with through thriving black communities that one took the property, but then two took that economic stability because now that my shoe store is closed, I have to go shop at your shoe store right? Mm -hmm. because I don't have anywhere else to buy shoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some similar um, type thing happened with the black businesses here in this town where I live now. Mm -hmm. And um, now that community, now they're like, Oh, what are we going to do about the South side of the community? But they intentionally, they divided the community by Absolutely. putting the highway through there. And I was in conversation with the mayor and I was like, what were people thinking when this happened? What he was like, well, we knew it was going to cause um, some strife, but um, we just, you know, we, we determined that, that the, the bad it would cause didn't outweigh the good it would bring. Wow. That's because it's not your life being impacted. It's right. It didn't impact <laughs> you. So your grandmother's house that, that people oh. had lived there for generations was not decimated by that freeway. So it didn't matter to you. No. And just leaves a little chunk of the city just kind of sitting. And, and they put a little plaque there commemorating all these businesses and that's supposed to, you know. <laughs> Yay. So part of understanding history, um, so the church I pastor is 155 years old. I think the building's 148 years old. It's the oldest building that was built by black people for black people, continuously owned and used for its original purposes in our entire region. Wow. Incredibly significant. So the building was dilapidated, you know, walls were falling in, crumbling, you know, all of this, that just historic buildings that had been left unkept. And behind mm -hmm. our building is this like valley where I learned that a lot of our community used to live and the houses all dilapidated and the property was purchased and it was torn down. So I was in this coffee house one day and this man, you know, we were just chatting and I say where I'm the pastor. And he's like, isn't that a coffee house? And I'm like, no, that's my church. And he's like, no, I, it's a coffee house. I'm like, no, I know it's my church. <laughs> he's wow. Like, and he starts telling me this story and he's describing my church. And I was like, sir, my church is not a coffee house. I just <laughs> preach there on Sunday. <laughs> but what I learned from his conversation is that the person who owned, owned the land behind our church had a plan to buy our church and make it into a coffee house. He was going to build college housing behind our church and make our church a coffee house. Wow. So they did this whole big community thing to get our church on the historic registry. Now, and I'm like, Wow. Like people don't usually just do things just for the sake of doing it. I'm like, why are we really doing this? Because you're doing this for the plaque, but you're not putting any money behind the property. Right. And I say all the time, they care about our property, but they don't care about our history. And so when I started talking about the history and the significance of our church and making our church, you know, creating a life in our church that, um, where the community became involved. So if, if they try to take us over again, you know, there's more people involved, but consequently then people came and volunteered and restored the church and you know, that it's, it's not in danger of falling in, but, but that's what they do. They, they watch our stuff and they see that it has value, it has good bones. It has good history. Absolutely. And they want our historical structures and they want to be the one who saved the property, but they don't want to be the ones who contribute to the ministries or whatever the thing is. It's and so, so funny to hear you say that because um, St. Mark is about 130 years old, so kind of the same age range. And Reverend Prison had um, some guys come by a couple of years ago wanting to buy the church. They want to buy mm -hmm. the building. Mm -hmm. But um, St. Mark is a historic building building. There are descendants of the founders who are still members of the church. So that church is not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, Lakeisha, you know, uh, Brother Joe Davis. Oh, yeah. One of his uh, um, ancestors was a founder of the church. And so there are lots of other people. But he was kind of taken aback. Reverend Pridgen was that they like just walked up one day and wanted to make an offer to buy the building because of, like you said, the property placement. Yeah. 
and they would yeah. probably gut it and put something else in there and talk about how it used to be a church. But it was kind of preposterous to him that they even approached <laughs> and asked about the building. And you can believe that whatever they offered, it's worth about five times that. Absolutely. Okay. And and the other thing that I learned is how they get they they're part of the um, the planning and zoning commission. They're on all these city commissions. Yes. They know what's coming. They know where the city's going. Absolutely. So they're looking down the road and it might be five years down the road. It might be 10 years down the road, but they know it's coming. So they're going to buy cheap so that they profit high. And in, when we don't understand our history, and this is where, you know, bringing it back to, to educating our, our young people, both black and white, you know, understanding not only our history, but the value and why this is valuable. Why, why is it important to, um, to, to maintain our historical structures? Why is it important for the stories to continue to be retold? Absolutely. Why is it important for our presence to be here? Um, that 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 has that has to be relevant, and if it isn't relevant to the younger generation, then we are going to continue. We are going to lose um, the historical places that tell our story, and they're going to tell our story. And when they tell our story, they will always come out the hero. Well, what is it that history is written by the victors? Yes. You know, and they rewrite it the way they want to. Yeah. So, Lakeisha, thank you for letting me I diverge there. <laughs> No, that, that was an excellent dialogue because it was so important to make the connection between education and economic empowerment yeah. because that is something that I feel like a lot of our communities have lost and continue to lose because you have people who inherit property and they don't understand the importance of you know their grandparents buying a house in this neighborhood and so they allow it to dilapidate and then the city either comes in and swoops it up or they sell it really cheap and then that's how gentrification happens. Absolutely. People are just like, oh, you know, I don't know what happened to the neighborhood. And Reverend Green made a great point, like in us not being at city council meetings, us not being a part yes. of the zoning commissions, because gentrification does not happen overnight. So mm -hmm. education is not just formal education, but it's also us being politically educated about what's happening in our communities and having a seat at the table. Because so often we talk about having a seat at the table, but my question becomes, well, what table do you want to seat at? Right. Do you want a seat at, at the table where the decisions are actually made, or do you just want to have a seat at a table where you can be seen? And be willing to sit in that seat. Don't argue for a seat so somebody else can take it. Right, right. We need to be willing to sit in that seat. You know, mm -hmm. I was visiting Dr. Broadnecks at Mount Olive one day, also in uh, Durham. And we were standing and he was pointing out different houses in the community. And there are two houses right across the street from Mount Olive, which is not in a community of you no know, multi-million dollar homes. And he was telling me that, you no, know, these houses have been gentrified and, and what they're for sale for now. And it is like a million dollars, three quarters of a million dollars right across the street from this small AME Zion church. Right. Because that's what's happening in our communities. And you see, you know, every third house is suddenly, you know, remodeled and painted this bright color that gets everybody's attention and the yard is well kept. So everything you're saying is exactly what I drive by every day. Wow. And but know, I did I, write down, oh, go, go ahead, Reverend Green. Sorry, so I, and I would be even less sore about that if they came to our churches. Right. But they're still going to drive to the other side of town and not come to the church across the street from them. Well, go to the coffee house on Sunday morning and not go to anybody's church. <laughs> that but is their so, choice. Like, okay, so you That's brought up a, a, great, a great point, um, Reverend Green, because people talk about Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. This is pre-pandemic, been the most segregated hour in America. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's another opportunity for education because a lot of people don't understand why church is so segregated. What are your thoughts on that? Because I, I, was in, I was in seminary and I was in a class and the professor said that the reason black and white people don't worship together is because of preaching styles. Black people prefer a more charismatic preaching style. And I was taken aback that I was in seminary and this is a doctor who, well, a PhD person who obviously does not understand the history of racism in, in churches. And it was a predominantly white seminary. So I'm thinking like, if this is the narrative that's being told to, you know, these white people who are preparing to go and be religious leaders, then how do we, how do we, how do we deal with that? <laughs> 
<laughs> so I I have I I I have an internal what do you call that? You know, like a pull, like a conflict inside. So um, I I understand the value of the black church experience for there to be space where people don't have to be on. You can be, you know, I have a good friend, good, good friend who she's just like, Reverend Renita, I do not do white people on Sunday. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I had church. I had church members that would not come to church the whole time I pastored there. I did home visits with them, and you know there was no animosity or hostility. They just could not do a white person in the pulpit of their black church. And I get it, you know. And sometimes I feel like I'm an invader in the space, mm. and that I this is not the space that I should be in. That that I am interrupting something that could be healing. But then at the same time, I also know I'm in the space that God has called for me to be in. And so I wrestle with that uh, reality. Um, I think that people need to be able to go to church wherever they want to go to church and be welcome. And so if people enjoy this type of worship, then go there. I mean, there are enough churches that you can find any flavor of worship you want to find. Um, but what I find different about the black church experience um, is in the messaging, not necessarily in the style. Right. So personally, I don't want to be in a church where the message is watered down. And um, I, I, I want to be challenged. I want to know about that liberating God. I want to, I want that encouragement and that, that challenge to speak truth to power. I want to know that God is on the side of the oppressed, and I want to know how to how to be part of uh, the 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 um, uh, the the theological liberation side. I, I I that's that's what I I I need, and I joined the church. Now I wasn't when I joined the church; it was more personal liberation. You know, I was in a horrible marriage, and you know where I was being beat up all the time, and you know, to hear that, you know, God, God doesn't expect us to live this way. That's where I heard this message. So, um, you know, I, I grew up, but I grew up Pentecostal. And so I was used to the fiery brimstone hails coming down and you better make sure the brimstone don't land on your head kind of message, you know? Um, so the worship style was an easy transition for me. It was, it was the same. But I also know people who don't, they say, black people say, it don't take all that. You know, they don't want to hear mm -hmm. the song that goes on for 15 minutes. And when the preacher says, I'm done now, they want the preacher to be done. And they're not trying to turn to their neighbor and high five anybody. <laughs> they don't want to talk to their neighbor. They don't want to say all the little colloquial and cliche things that we're told to say <laughs> in church. You know, they just want to get the message and go home. And they want to get to the restaurant before the, the Kojic church does. <laughs> you know, they want to get out. So um, so I don't think it's fair to say that this is a white way, way to worship or a black way to worship. I think that it's personalities and that there are enough experiences for us to find where our personality fits. I think that um, um, that white people don't tend to go to black church because white people tend to want, um, they look at, they, they, they're looking at church through their, their lens, through their experiences. Mm -hmm. And so things like children's church instead of intergenerational worship where intergenerational worship <clears throat> is more commonplace in the black church experience, white church experience will, you know, snatch your kids and go put them in the bouncy house. You know, in our churches, they you're going to sit there, you're going to listen and you're going to learn something and you're going to like it and you're going to stand and you're going to sing and you're going to clap. And I'm not saying that there aren't children's churches, you know, that are part of black church experience. I'm saying that it's not, that it's, it's not as commonplace. Um, and so, and then the, the fellowship. Now, like in our church, we do Black History Moments every Sunday. We mm -hmm. celebrate birthdays. We celebrate anniversaries. We celebrate good grades. And somebody asked me about that once. And I'm like, well, you know what? Our students aren't getting celebrated in the schools. Mm. You know, they're straight A students and they're not coming home with the certificates. So they're getting their celebration from us. 
we're the ones showing up in numbers at their plays when they're in the plays and we're on the teams. And, and so it becomes a much different experience because we see how whatever is happening on the outside, the church is the place to receive the support and the encouragement and the fellowship to be able to deal with all that stuff out there. And so whatever that, that predominant community is that's impacting or could possibly impact the self-esteem of our children, the church is there to counterbalance that, to say, no, you are worthy. No, we, have, we celebrate you. We believe you. We believe you when you say the teacher said. We believe you when you say that all the kids did that and you're the only one who got in trouble. We're the ones who are going to show up at those meetings. And I've shown up at a lot of meetings where the with parents who, um, had they gone to that meeting alone, uh, they would have been outnumbered by school officials trying to put their kids in special education or in alternative school programs. So, you know, that the church, the black church has a different place. And, and white people, if they want to be part of that, then they have to be willing to be part of that without shifting what what black church is they have to fit in not not try to change that and and it's hard for white people to see um through through the, the see see the value based upon their ex, their previous experiences in church i think white people also struggle with being the minority mm-hmm. you know being one or two in a group of 100 200 300 I think you're right. We're used to that. I went to a predominantly white university. So when my friends and I were what we call on the yard between our classes, it was a bunch of us. Then when we went to class, there may be one other black person in our class, depending on what the class was, the size of the class, all that good stuff. So we are accustomed to being in the minority in various kinds of spaces. I think, you know, white people who, and I hate to speak so generally, but I think it's possible, let me say it that way that they're kind of uncomfortable when they come into a black church. And and then they're gonna hear some black liberation theology. Cause I can tell you my pastors talk <laughs> and they talk real. I remember um, right after the Mother Emanuel tragedy and Dylan Roof and, and Dr. Coleman before he retired was still our pastor then. And he said, y'all better not let somebody come in here. <laughs> he said they can't get all of us. You better not. So you know, you know, I, I don't think they are comfortable with the things that they want us to be comfortable with, and being yeah. put in the situations and spaces that that is supposed to be normal for us. Right. You know, I mean, Band Aid just started making dark brown Band Aids. Mm-hmm. I go buy a pair of of stockings that are flesh tone. It's not my flesh. It's your flesh. Mm-hmm. You know, nude. It's not my nude. It's your nude. Mm-hmm. So. I don't think white folk really handle well being in the minority or having to share that space because that's one of the things we hear from the political commentators now. They're, they're trying to take us down. They're trying to take over. Yeah. You know, like God set them up to be in charge of everybody. You know, I, I think that is a struggle for some. Let me say it that way: some white people. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with you. I've um, I've I'm, I've started getting a little braver with my colleagues and my friends and pushing back a little bit but often when we're in you know things like this or in my class sessions um so i'm a demon student they'll say well renita i don't mean this to offend you or you know like try to say something that would make me feel more comfortable and um i push back i started pushing back and saying i'm not here to be comfortable and if white people enter black space, then white people need to enter authentic black space. Mm-hmm. And we don't need to water down messages and we don't need to be more concerned about white feelings than we are black liberation. Because until we are all free, we're not any free. And if white people aren't willing to face um, our role as oppressors and even the most liberated white person, we, you know, I've been immersed in black family and culture for over 30 years. And I constantly called out on, I'm white. I mean, I, I'm just, you know, I don't know. It's like some genetic crap that happens inside us or something. I don't know. But even my kids who identify, they self-identify as being um, half white and 100% black. They're like, <laughs> we're black. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, they will, you know, I, I love them. 
and I hurt with them and I feel with them, but I will never really get the depth of what they what they experience. And it's it's so important that we be open and authentic because you know, I, I referenced how we dealt with things after the Mother Emanuel tragedy. And that's real. So many black churches started locking their doors. You know, before, you know, you could walk in anytime. Now somebody had to be on post. Lakeisha, I remember the first time we went to um, the Transformation Center in Rock Hill for something after that. And those other doors were locked and you could only enter through one door. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and so it may be even more uncomfortable for white people in black spaces now, especially church, because after that, a white person. Now, where's the in, suspect one? <laughs> like, <laughs> Somebody, all eyes on you. <laughs> we, we've had, so being in Durham, since I've been here, we've had people who come with um, the different shows that travel to come to like the DPAC. And we had a guy who was um, like with the Motown show that came and he said he just wanted to find a church. He Googled, he found St. Mark, he came to church. We were very welcoming to him. But, you know, after after that, we probably would have been like, somebody, you know, just kind of keep your eye on him. But, you know, it's true that we have to kind of, I hate that we have to explain that feeling. Right. And then when we do, it's like, they still don't understand why we feel that way because um, you're a D men student. I'm getting a master of arts in Christian practice at Duke Divinity School. And I remember my first week we did an exercise um, with Lectio Divina where we were supposed to close our eyes and, and pray. And um, we were in small groups and then we had to talk about it afterwards. And I told them, I said, well, after the first two minutes I opened my eyes because after that shooting, I'm very nervous about being in spaces where all of us are in here with our eyes closed. Anybody can walk in the front door of the, the, the divinity school and make their way to this classroom. And so my, my two partners were white and they both were kind of, you know, I could see it and the way they looked at me. I said, I'm just being honest with you. Yeah. I was not comfortable sitting here for 10 minutes with my eyes closed. Dylan Roof went to Bible study with those people. Right. He prayed with them. They prayed for him very likely. And then he killed them. So I'm just not comfortable being in certain spaces right now, several years later, when everyone in there has their eyes closed. Mm -hmm. That's just my reality. And I think with education comes this understanding of why black people are suspect of white people in black space. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm asked, many times i've been in the amy church more than half my life now and um often still ask what are you doing here and that's a legit question right. you know it's and you know why people who are going to get their feelings hurt with those legit questions this isn't their space um is that that's a legit question that i think there's reason to be suspect why people don't have a good history of showing up in black space authentically and um, to be receivers they they tend to show up um, to be takers. And so um, what and so when we understand that that has been the history and what colonization really looks like, then we can really recognize colonization when it happens through nonprofits that are colonizing our communities or white churches that are colonizing our communities. Um, we, we that that information transfers over. So the earlier that these lessons began to be um, begin to be taught, the less, um, um, oh my God, they become, you know, it's like, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, white people are embarrassed about our history and we should be, um, but, but that embarrassment can't be to the point of let's stick our head in the sand and pretend like things didn't happen so that we don't have to have our shame exposed. So that brings me to a great um, final question. It's hard to believe that our time is almost up, but um, I was at a, I was in a, a cohort, so to speak, and we were lamenting about racism and it was a predominantly white group. And I came to the realization that it's not the work of black people to do this level of education and awareness, but I'm not quite sure how we get white people to the point of wanting to be educated and wanting to be aware and wanting to have this increased sensitivity about what it means to be white in black spaces and what it just means to be black. Like education is definitely a tool resource, 
but it's not as much black people. Like there are some things that we need to be educated on about our own history, but how do you all think we can move forward to do this work to educate white people so that we can start to really see a change? Well, honestly, um, just to kind of go further with what you said, I think it's going to be the work of white people to call out and educate other white people. Um, because when we say something, you know, we get defensive and and all of those other words. Um, you know, it's hard for me to tell you why you should let me in. Again, going back to all the talk we're hearing on you know, CNN and Fox and MSNBC, all these other shows, you know, for white people seem to see the world as a pie. And if I get more, they get less. Instead of there's enough, you know, for everyone. And it's like they, they really think someone wants to take things from them, take space from them, take property from them. And, and maybe going back to something Reverend Green said is because, you know, the, the history is so much that they are takers. Mm hmm. And, and they see, you know, equity and equality instead of as a shared experience as them losing something. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, the, if we start running for school board and there's no longer, you know, seven white members and one black member and it starts to flip, it's like they've lost something. Mm -hmm. So I, I really don't know that that's something that we can teach them. What we can do is show up and be there and, and show that our intent is for the good of all. Because just because I want my children to be treated equally to yours doesn't mean I want your children mistreated. I just want my children treated right. Mm -hmm. But I think it is going to come down to our white allies being the ones who do push back and call out you know, the overt and covert racism when it happens because they are on those boards and in those spaces and in those meetings. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Reverend Green? Well, um, um, Portia said a lot of really deep stuff. Um, I agree with, um, I think it is white people's work. Um, the thing that scares me is that white people often don't go deep enough into our own work and the stories and the understandings aren't authentic. They're just, they're kind of watered down and there are not enough white people who are doing the in-depth self work um, to adequately, I don't know what the word is, you know, <laughs> push. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's not fair for um, people of color to have to continue to be re-traumatized by just saying, you know, I'm, I'm worthy. I'm, I have worth. You know, like people shouldn't have to say I have worth. So that's, um, you know, that's this dichotomy, you know, do we want white people doing the, all the work, but is it fair for black people to have to be re-traumatized in doing the work? Um, and um, I thought that left my brain, it'll come back. Um, the use of the word ally, um, I, I continue to push people back, push, push beyond allyship um, allies, when you, you look at the, what allies do, like allies join a cause or join, join a side when it benefits them mm -hmm. and when it no longer benefits them or it puts too much at risk for them, then they can withdraw. And I think allyship is the starting point, but we need to move white people beyond allyship into community mm -hmm. and to family because I'm not going to let this happen to my child. And if I'm not going to let this happen to my child, then your child ought to mean as much to me as my child. We're family. We're human family. Now, somebody pushed back and said, well, you can't tell black people who their family is. And I was like, no, they don't have to say I'm family. I'm saying they're my family. And so the way we the way we advocate, the way we love, the way we press is not dependent upon what we're getting back from it. And that's what white people do, <laughs> you know? Well, if you're not appreciating me enough for putting everything at risk, then I'm not gonna put everything at risk. Well, if we don't risk everything, we haven't risked anything. And if we don't risk without the promise of reward, then we really haven't authentically risked anyway. So it's a continual growth and a continual press forward. Um, and, um, and also, um, 
that's this, this other thing that I can't remember. <laughs> Portia said I was going to say something too. That's why I've been cheating. I have a notepad and a pen over here. <laughs> oh, right. It came back to me. It came back to me. It came back to me. So, uh, so why people as uh, what they're giving up or what they think they're losing, what really they're losing, and I say they like I'm not white, right? Like, but what white people are losing is is um, privilege and prominence. And why people just don't know how to lose privilege. Now they will deny that there is even such a thing as white privilege, and they'll they'll take yes. that to their grave. But they will fight for it to their grave too, and mm -hmm. in various ways. And so this whole thing about white guilt and white tears, and you know, white people don't feel white guilt. That's just a sham. You know, they're not all oh my god, I can't believe it. Oh. You know, that's 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 un that's disingenuous. That's centering self, bringing self into the center of emotions. It makes them a victim. It makes them a victim or or a martyr or mm -hmm. a hero. That's it. You know, like mm -hmm. we have to somehow be the center of this story. Um, but but what we really need to do is to grow into a space where where we're not the center of the story, um, where we are, we're just a co-laborer in this movement. Because, because humanity depends upon us recognizing our own humanity and understanding that we can't be, be good humans and be oppressors. Mm -hmm. We can't be good humans and not be liberators. We cannot be good humans and not intentionally work to undo the misinformation, the miseducation, and the um, just the crap that has happened historically. We have to be intentional about that. And if white people aren't intentionally working to undo what has done, then we're intentionally building on what has been done. Mm -hmm. And this, this, there's no neutrality in this. And so, um, so back again to the education, you know, sometimes education also means um, re-educating and, and, and uneducating. Is that a word? Is that right? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it a word. You can you can make it your own word today. And can I throw in really quickly because I see you wrapping it up. Yep. Education doesn't always have to be formal either. We are, right. we are also formed by what we see and what we experience. Absolutely. So, I mean, they want to look at it formally, like, you know, North Carolina had all this controversy this year about the social studies standards and um, wanting to change the words racism, it's systemic racism and all that good stuff in the curriculum. But race, I mean, I'm sorry, but education is more than just formal. Yeah. It's also in the people we encounter every day. It's, it's informal as well. Amen. Well, thank you ladies so much for getting up early this morning to join me for this conversation. It was definitely a vision that I had and you all exceeded what I expected from the conversation. And thank you to our audience who um, have been like fired up in the chat. I'll make sure that you all get a copy of the chat so that you can see the comments, but it's definitely a conversation that I feel is needed. And at some point we're gonna have to find a way to expand the conversation and to bring in more white people to dialogue with us so that we can start to do this work because um, even though it's not our job, I believe, to do the work for white people, I think that there is a role that we need to play. And as Reverend Green said, helping them to go deeper and to think deeper about the issues. And it's going to be uncomfortable, but I'm prayerful that, you know, if we're truly to create God's kingdom here on earth, we cannot do that, um, continuing to be segregated. So I don't know what that's going to look like. And if anyone has any suggestions, feel free to send them to me because, you know, this is a work in progress. But I do want to thank my beautiful um, guests for getting up this morning. Thank you, guys. We will be back at um, 9 o'clock with um, our keynote speaker for the morning, um, Jennifer Watley Maxell. And then we will be kicking off our breakout session. So we have a great day um, planned for you all. If you have any questions, if you need anything, feel free to send me a message. But thank you, Reverend Green. Thank you, Portia, um, for a great opening conversation this morning. Amen. Thank, thank you, you so for much having this opportunity. Me. Thank you.
Nice to meet you, Portia. Nice to meet you as well.